Hi everybody, it's me Mr. Olson and I teach you biology and today we're going to walk through the midterm review, day one. Uh, this will be day one of, I should just write this here, I should say it's day of four. Um, in class we're only doing three days of review, um, but there will be a fourth session that will be posted online this Saturday and uh, you should be able to see some genetics review, stuff about mitosis, meiosis, and genetics. Um, I know that's been really recent for us so we're not too worried about uh, you know, not knowing that stuff for the midterm, but just in case it'll be there for you. So let's go ahead and start with uh, the very first things we learned in class uh, starting back in August. So the first thing is going to be science versus pseudoscience. Uh, science is just study of the world around us in a systematic way, and we can see that. We notice that all the time, uh, especially in, uh, in class, where we're kind of looking at it in a systematic way. But there's another science out there called a pseudoscience, which means fake science. Um, and it is considered a fake science because it's not really based on empirical evidence. That's the key thing. We have empirical evidence. Um, and there are a few parts to making uh, science distinguish itself uh, different than others. Namely, we use an experimental design to help us figure things out. Um, one of those components would be an independent variable. Uh, this is going to be the factor that's being tested. Um, sometimes it's just called the manipulated variable, um, and at other times um, people just refer to it as the IV or the independent variable. Uh, next up, we have the dependent variable. This is the factor that uh, basically is what we're trying to measure. It's the thing that we're looking for as our results of the experiment. Uh, the independent variable directly influences the dependent variable. And once again, sometimes it is called the measured variable. Um, I'm not saying those words will show up on this test necessarily, but maybe on the EOC or maybe just helping you understand it. Those are good words to have in your brain. Um, one thing that kids confuse with uh, each other are constants and control groups. Um, we can see a constant here. These are the factors that stay the same throughout the experimental design. Um, the, exper the example I was using in class today uh, was basically, uh, if you re recall, our yeast fermentation lab. We had these flasks uh, with balloons on them uh, and we added sugar and water that was hot uh, and uh, yeast. And we basically saw what happened over a period of time. Well, uh, everything that was the same, that remained in all the test groups the same, would be examples of constants. For instance, um, the temperature of the water, the amount of water, the amount of yeast, um, the size of the flask, uh, the quality of the balloon, the size of the balloon, the color of the balloon, um, the amount of time that we used in all of our experimental designs, those would be constants in that experiment. Um, the one group that did not receive an independent variable, um, that's what we refer to as the control group. Uh, and we really compare our, our final results to that. Um, now, if you remember from that experiment, the balloons uh, that were on the, on the flask with no sugar at all, they still inflated with a little bit of air. Not a lot, but a little bit. Uh, and that's really one of those things that shows us, hey, um, something can happen. Uh, but not as much as what we'd expect with sugar involved. So uh, control groups are good to uh, have an experimental design. It kind of confirms our thoughts. Um, it's very, very important in a lot of experimental design. Um, up next, we're going to go ahead and talk about the scientific method. Generally speaking, we start with something known as a problem, um, but you can phrase that also as a question. Um, and then from that, we usually develop a hypothesis. Um, I should also mention, because a lot of kids have been talking to me about it this way, um, there is research involved, and I agree, we use research all the time, um, and a hypothesis, uh, try to keep in mind, is written as an if-then statement, if blank, then blank, uh, and this does a good job in reinforcing the independent variable and the dependent variable, um, that's what would be in those planks, um, respectively. Um, and also, this is a, uh, it's not just an educated guess, that's one of the terms uh, that kids have been learning for years and years and years, but in class we learned that it's a um, a prediction that you can actually test, um, and it's got to be uh, written in a way that you can falsify, in a way that you can uh, look at and say that's right or that's wrong, and that's really important in science. We don't want vague hypotheses. Um, we want a really strong one that we can say, yes, that is wrong, or no, that's not. Um, anyway, after that we design an experiment, um, and this actually goes back to everything we talked about, the independent variable, the dependent variable, the constants, the control group. Um, all of those are factors that we find involved. 
uh, in an experimental design. I know it seems a little redundant, but this is how I teach it. Um, after you design an experiment, you actually have to do that experiment. Uh, remember, uh, if you don't do the same experiment that you plan to do, then you're not testing your hypothesis, and that's kind of the point of your experiment. Um, after that, we're able to go to something called data analysis, or we can analyze our data. And here, there are two different, this actually connects to number four down here. Um, there are two different types of data that we use. Um, we have qualitative and quantitative. Uh, qualitative is going to be something that you would describe, whereas quantitative, that's going to be something that is considered a, a number, a, a, something we can measure. Um, so how far did the rocket travel? That would be a measure of distance. That would be quantitative data. Um, qualitative data would be something we'd have to describe with the, uh, you know, words, um, something that we've experienced from our senses. So you might, uh, you might say, oh, this, this solution changed color from red to green to blue. Um, you'd have to use words to describe that. Did it happen quickly? Was it cloudy? Was it clear? Things like that. Those would be all qualitative. Um, and then after we're doing that, we can do a conclusion. And uh, a conclusion is always, 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 always going to be based on a hypothesis. Um, now, you can do one of two things with this. You can decide to reject your hypothesis, which means, hey, you may have to redesign your hypothesis, come up with a new one. Maybe your hypothesis is actually OK, but your experimental design, that's the thing that's off. Heck, there's even situations where you can just redo the experiment. Um, and Due to human error, we made a mistake the first time, now we're gonna try again. That's all very possible. Um, or you can end up in a situation where you accept um, your experimental results and you wanna share them with people. Um, you may have discovered something new. Um, and we submit to this to a process called peer review, which means you share your results and information with people who are like-minded, people who have studied things the same way as you, um, and hopefully they can look at your results and say, yeah, you did a great job. Or they might look at it and say, no, there's some problems. There's something going wrong here. Um, this is one of the most beautiful things about science is that we can actually check each other's work and see if we make mistakes so we don't um, you know, falsely proclaim things that aren't true. So uh, yeah. That's basically the process of science or a scientific method. Um, next up, we have the basics of chemistry. Um, the first thing I want to point out to you is just the basic parts of an atom. Um, you'll notice that protons are definitely positive. Neutrons have no real charge. Um, they are neutral and electrons are very much negative. Um, if we look at the structure of an atom, um, we see the middle region and we see these like little rings that kind of go around the outside of that. Um, the middle region here is going to be called the nucleus and it's going to be made up of the of the uh, of the protons. I'm going to do that in a different color in protons uh, and neutrons. Um, and they'll be contained in there around the edge. We're going to find those electrons. Um, and generally speaking, um, just to remind you, uh, we do have those little concentric rings, those orbitals for electrons that go around the outside of the nucleus. Um, and the number of electrons we can hold starting from the middle and going outward, um, that would be two, eight, and eight. We call these valence electrons. Um, I wouldn't expect too many questions on the midterm about it, but it's a good time to always bring it up. Um, next up, we want to define what polar and nonpolar mean. Uh, polar are basically polar covalent bonds, um, and polar would basically mean it's an uneven sharing of electrons, whereas nonpolar means an even sharing of electrons. Um, this will actually connect to what kind of bond is, is holding these things together. Um, you guys might recall um, when we look at a water molecule, it basically looks like a Mickey Mouse head upside down. Um, one side of the molecule is positive while another side is uh, negative. Um, and the reason for that is because the oxygen molecule, the larger, I'm sorry, the oxygen atom, the larger atom is a bit selfish and it kind of takes those uh, electrons away from the hydrogens most of the time, which means just one single proton is sticking out into wherever. Uh, and that means there's a more positive charge left on that side. When it comes to those different types of bonds, we have covalent bonds. Um, just once again, remember you have polar and nonpolar covalent bonds, so they can uh, arrange themselves differently. Uh, we also have ionic bonds and hydrogen bonds. Ionic bonds are whenever you, uh, you gain or lose electrons. Um, if we gain an electron, we call that a, uh, 
uh, it, it's becoming more negative, so we call that an anion. And if you lose electrons, you're becoming more positive, and we call that a cation. Remember, cats have paws, so it's positive. Um, covalent bonds, these are electrons being shared, um, and it's a really strong bond. It's, it's very, very strong. Um, and uh, this is probably the one that uh, you see all the time. Anytime people show um, atoms connected to each other and they use a solid line, maybe it looks something like this. Um, that represents a covalent bond. So it's very common, very important, very strong. Um, and then we have uh, hydrogen bonds. These are relatively weak. Um, not saying they're not important. They very much are. It's just they're not as strong as covalent or ionic bonds. Um, and basically, uh, for molecules, this is a bit of a simplified definition, but between the hydrogen of one molecule and the oxygen or nitrogen of another molecule, we can see an attraction because there's a positive negative charge in both of those. Um, if we look at water one more time, um, we can see that they arrange themselves so that the negative and positive ends of different molecules want to come in contact with each other. This attraction is a hydrogen bond. Um, so there you go. There would be the uh, three types of bonds that we studied in class. Uh, next up would be the properties of water. And we've left a little blank up here, and that would mean that hydrogen bonds uh, are the things that cause um, these special properties of water. Um, so uh, the first property out there is cohesion. That should sound really familiar to you because uh, we studied this pretty extensively. Um, and we said of these properties, cohesion is when water sticks to water. Um, the other one that's a lot like that um, is when water is attracted to other substances as well. So water's pretty diverse. It likes itself. It likes other things pretty readily. Uh, and that's all because of those hydrogen bonds forming. Now remember, um, a hydrogen bond is a positive bond or a, a positive end of a molecule sticking to the negative end of a molecule or vice versa. Um, it's, it's versatile in that regard, so it can bond to positive or negative items. Um, the next one is kind of tricky, um, especially the phrasing. It's called different things in different capacities, but um, high specific heat is the phrase we use in class. Uh, and we're basically saying it takes a lot of energy uh, to change the temperature of water. Um, basically, it resists change in temperature. We could define it that way, too. Um, this is important for a lot of living systems, especially humans, um, because when I go outside, because it, and if it's freezing outside, I don't suddenly turn into a block of ice. The water doesn't change into ice. Um, it takes a while. So that's pretty good for um, maintaining organisms or maintaining living systems, uh, and it's uh, pretty nice. Uh, I like it. It also explains a lot of the climate, especially here in Florida. We're surrounded by water, um, and water retains heat really well, um, which might directly influence our climate. Um, the next one here um, is talking about when water gets really cold, it freezes, and whenever it does freeze, it expands. That's because the hydrogen bonds manage to space out um, during that freezing process. And basically, it can help water act as an insulator. Um, I know here in Florida we don't get this too often, um, but sometimes ice forms um, outside because, uh, you know, it can get pretty cold. Um, and what we're saying is like a lake or a river, they might freeze over, but they don't freeze through. So the bottom is still... Um, moving water. It's still liquid, um, whereas the top uh, layer is ice, and it's actually insulating the rest of the water from becoming too cold. Um, and because that's spacing out a little bit extra, it expands. Um, I'm just going to add one more thing here, even though it's not written in. Um, it's a very versatile solvent. Um, and a versatile solvent means it would be kind of considered the universal solvent, it would help dissolve almost anything, but uh, well, the, one of those doesn't quite exist. So um, water is really common. It's really important. And if you see a mixture of anything that looks wet, more than likely water is involved. So uh, it's, it's a really, really big, uh, big deal um, thanks to those hydrogen bonds. Uh, topic four talks about the different macromolecules. Just to clarify something, um, macromolecules and carbon-based molecules are the same thing. Um, we're saying all the macromolecules, the four that there are, um, all of them are based in carbon. So there is a carbon component to every single one of them. Um, first and foremost, you should remember that monomers and polymers, they are related to each other. Basically, uh, the word mono means one and the word poly means many. Um, we're saying a monomer is a small component that works together with other small components to make a larger thing called a polymer. So all of these, all macromolecules are polymers. 
um, and we're going to have to understand they have some monomers. We'll talk about what those are. Uh, the first one would be carbohydrates. These are the main energy molecule. I'm just going to go ahead and write short term next to it as well, um, because we usually use carbohydrates in a short term capacity. Um, if you eat a bunch of pixie sticks, um, you're going to get a little sugar rush. And that's because the body's like, hey, sugar, it's really easy to break down. Let me burn it for some energy. Um, so the simple version is just referred to as sugar or simple sugar. More complex versions, um, good examples would include starches. Um, you've heard of potatoes and rice and bread and pasta, all that stuff having starch. Uh, and it's true, it does contain um, a very long chain of simple sugars, uh, which we know is a polysaccharide. Um, so the monomer that make these up are called monosaccharides. Uh, so I'm just writing monomer next to it, letting you know that's what they're called. Their monomer is called a monosaccharide. Uh, proteins, uh, they're mostly structures in your bodies and cells. Um, they could be broken down for energy, but that's only in extreme cases. They're mostly the functional molecule of your body. You, you can't really do anything without proteins. Um, everything that you are is based on proteins. Um, your hair color, your skin color, um, your ability to digest some foods, um, your, your ability to uh, be, you know, be affected by some diseases. It's all based on proteins, your blood type. My goodness, everything's pretty much proteins. Uh, and these are made up of a monomer, monomer referred to as amino acids. And hopefully you guys remember, I told you to get a tattoo of this on your body because it's that important to know. Amino acids make up proteins. Um, lipids, uh, these are the most energy um, containing molecules that we have. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they're so good at it, we use them for long-term storage. Uh, so I'm writing that up there for you. Um, they can be used for structure as well, especially in our cell membranes. We have a phospholipid bilayer, which is part, well, really, it's the fluid mosaic model. Um, and that's really, really important to giving fluidity to our cells. Um, so it is very much a, a important structure that we have. Um, and it doesn't really have a monomer. If I were to pick one thing, it would be called a fatty acid. Um, I'm not making that up. It's really called just a fatty acid. Um, and it basically looks like a little chain, a little zigzag. Um, and we'll see that a pretty to be a pretty common component to lipids. Sometimes they're really long, sometimes they're not. But that shape might look familiar to you. Um, the last one, something that we haven't talked about a lot this half of the year, but we'll definitely talk a lot about it in the next half of the year. Um, it would be... Uh, the the nucleic acids which are uh, made up of these things called nucleotides um, so that's their monomer helping you out there um, and it's just your genetic information and once again we're going to talk more about this later on but you should definitely know this is your genetic information and they're made up of nucleotides um, when it comes to chemical reactions there's not a whole lot to know i just want to um, frame it for you a little bit um, reactants are things that form or break apart um, and the products are the things that are being created from a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions, we write those out. Um, the example I've been using is hydrogen gas and oxygen gas um, can work together to form water. Um, now I'd have to balance this equation, so real quick, I'll do that for you. Um, and then, yeah, everything's all happy. Everything on the left-hand side here, um, these are what we consider our reactants, okay? Uh, everything on the right hand side we're going to refer to as our products. Um, if I were to rearrange this formula and I was going to do 2H2O um, and then I'd form 2 hydrogen and 2 oxygen, well then that's going to be the exact same thing. It, it's still the reactants on the left hand side and the products on the other, other side. Um, no, you're not going to have to remember this chemical equation. This is a pretty simple one. But we talked about a few earlier this year uh, when we were talking about cell respiration and photosynthesis. You should be aware of those and exactly what is a reactant and a product in both of those processes. So that's why I kind of bring it up now. Um, last topic for this session, um, enzymes. Enzymes are wildly important. They are proteins in most cases uh, that basically function in your body to speed up chemical reactions and they do this by lowering activation energy. Uh, I think uh, I'll draw this for you up here. Um, we have like a graph that kind of shows that represents um, the use of energy. So we're saying like this is zero and we're saying a gain and a loss. Um, we're saying we're, we have to build up some energy from this point um, to this point. And that's the amount of energy needed to start the reaction. So um, 
lowering activation energy would mean um, instead of using the green line, now we'd use the red line. and We'd end up in the same place, but we're using less energy. Uh, and that helps us out a lot with reactions. It saves us energy. Um, when uh, it comes to how enzymes work, um, we generally refer to it as the lock and key model. Um, that's not actually true. Um, that's an old model and it's kind of outdated, but whatever. It helps us un understand the topic a little bit better. So um, this thing would be our enzyme. And let's go ahead and say this poorly drawn um, thing is going to include two substrates. Substrates are basically the reactants of a chemical equation. Um, so we're either bringing these things together or maybe that we're tearing them apart, but you'll notice the substrates fit onto the enzyme like a puzzle piece. They fit in there exactly the same, like a key into a lock. Only some locks will open with the particular key. Um, so the same way um, a, a reaction will occur with a particular enzyme with particular substrates. Um, so this really confirms a really important concept in biology. The shape of something usually influences the function of something. Um, when it comes to activation energy, once again, I already kind of talked about that earlier, but it's the amount of energy required for a reaction to take place. So from this area up here to this area down here, um, that would be activation energy. That's a little short um, term for you. Um, and we're saying we can, we can use less energy to create these um, wonderful, powerful um, processes. And the last thing for today, what affects enzyme activity would be um, the amount of pH. Oh, that's a bad one. Uh, the amount of pH, or if it's acidic or basic, um, that would mess with the hydrogen bonds that affect the shape of an enzyme. Um, and then, of course, temperature. Um, temperature, if it's too cold or too hot, that can definitely influence the hydrogen bonds, which may break apart the protein, which is the enzyme, which, of course, wouldn't function anymore. And even the concentration. Um, if you have a lot of that enzyme in your body, um, you can probably handle a lot of that process as much as you want to. Um, if you don't have a lot of that enzyme, then you're probably not going to be able to get everything done. Um, and even though you might be able to speed up the chemical reaction, um, you don't have enough enzymes to be able to do the job. Um, it would be like having a factory run by very, very few workers. Um, it's not going to produce you anymore. Even if you have a high tech, fancy facility, if nobody's there to run it, then it's not going to do the job. Okay, so that's the end of day one or session one. Um, look forward to uh, seeing you guys in class, helping you review. If you have any questions, let me know. And uh, maybe you'll watch the next video too. All right, see you later.